Sunday evening. I pray that you've had a great day. I've had a great day with Jesus. I had a great Sunday morning service. We saw a family we hadn't seen in a minute. And, you know, it's always just sweet when the children of God get together. And I, I just, is a sweet spirit about God. And I, I know folks are following the last few uh, football games, but we're in the house of God. <laughs> and our team already won the battle, amen? <laughs> we already know who won the Super Bowl. We know the outcome, and I'm glad to be on the winning side. And you can be on the winning side, too, if only you'd accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. I, I have nothing against sports, but uh, I I'm telling you, this world is so fleeting. And, and uh, what's in today is out tomorrow, but Jesus, he's the same yesterday, today, and for ever. I'm glad to be a child of the king. So if you feel like I do, let's have church. Let's stand and go before him with our hands lifted up and our hearts full of praise. Father, we worship you, oh God, for your faithfulness. Thank you, Lord God, for how you're always there, meeting every need, God. Hallelujah. Lord, hear the praises of your children, Lord. Father, we're so grateful for your mercy. Lord, your loving kindness, your power that's even here tonight, oh Lord. Touch hearts and minds, Father. Lord, we've got prayer requests. We've got people who are dealing with sickness, oh God. Oh, but we have a Father up in heaven who's a healer, who's a deliverer, who's able to bring all things to pass. All we have to do is call upon that name. You said, trust in my son. Oh, Jesus says, if you ask anything in my name, my Father will give it thee. Lord, we need a touch, Father. Heal the sick, Lord. Strengthen their confidence in you. And Lord, we'll be careful and sure to give you the praise, to give you the glory and the honor. In the mighty name of Jesus, can somebody say amen? Hallelujah. Let's go to Calvary. Well, years I spent in vanity and pride, caring not my Lord was crucified, knowing not it was for me he died on Calvary. Mercy there was great and grace was free, pardon there was multiplied to me.
I got to put my mic down so I can fly. Hallelujah. Well, some glad morning when this life is over. the devil he's under my feet the devil is under come on let's go i went to the enemy's camp and i took back what he stole from me you know i took back yes i took back i went I took back my home. I took back my joy. I took back my peace. I took back my life. I took back my victory. I took back my love. I took back what he stole from me. You know I took back what he stole from me. Yes, I took back. under your feet. Put that dude on the run. He wants to keep you from praising God. He wants you to think the battle's already won. That dude's a liar. I say he's a liar. God is on the throne. God is on the move. By his Holy Spirit, he's doing great things. I want you
you to know, I want you to know the battle's not done. I say the battle is not done. This is not our home. God's preparing a place. I read the book. Come on, Brother Ken. I read the book. He said when we get to heaven, there are many mansions. There's one for me. There's one for you. Anybody got him? I got the Holy Ghost. Anybody got him? I got him. I've got him. I've got him. I've got him. There's something about that Holy Ghost I can't explain, but I've got him. I've got him. He's got me. He's got me. Hallelujah. He's got me. He's got me. There's something about that Holy Ghost I can't explain, but he's got me. He's got me. You know what? He's just like fire in my bones. He's just like fire in my bones. He's just like fire in my bones. The Holy Ghost is fire. Come on, sound off. Fire, fire, fire. Well, he's fire, fire, fire in my bones. He's fire, fire, fire in my bones. The Holy Ghost is fire. Fire, fire. Yes, he's fire, fire, fire in my bones. The Holy Ghost is fire in my. Raise your hands tonight. Oh, God. Send down that Holy Ghost fire. Send it down, oh Lord. Send them down in our hearts and souls. Send them down in our cities, Lord. Let them awake from their sleep. Let them realize. This victory can be ours. We can stand with you. Oh, that bright sunny morning. Lord, when God just calls his children home, it'll be worth it all. It'll be worth it all. You'll say, I remember, I remember standing on the firing line, standing alongside my brethren as we lifted up the name of Jesus. It was only a few of us on a Sunday night. It was only a few of us in the house of God, but we made a stand for what was right. We decided I won't give up and I can't give in. I'm not going back, hallelujah, because I must run on. Anybody feel like you want to run on? Hallelujah. Well, I must run on in this Christian race. I must run on. Until I see God's face, I must run on Through the storm and the rain, I must run on Though there's sorrow and pain, well I must run on Though I lose my best friend, I must run on I know I win in the end, but getting the things behind me No power to earth can buy me, I'm gonna run until I hear him say Well done! And Noah, who walked with God, David with his heart, his staff and his rod, all the tribes of Israel that crossed the Red Sea, Moses, Aaron, and Joshua are begging for me. The saints above, by faith I can see, and heaven's grandstand, they are beckoning me. They shout it, come on! You can make it if you try, shout it, come on! Sin and Satan defy, shout it, come on. You are nearing your goal, shout it, come on. And find rest for your soul, shout it, come on. Meet your loved one who's gone, shout it, come on. Around that great white road, with wings on my feet and fire in my bones, I'm gonna run until I hear. Come raise your hand. Father, that we can magnify your name. Oh, glory to our God. He's worthy. I say he's worthy of praise. He's worthy to receive glory and honor. I want him to know how much I love him. 
I want him to know how much I need him. I can't do anything without him. God, have your way. Have your way in our hearts and minds today. Give the Lord a clap off. He's worthy. Worthy to receive the praise, the glory, and the honor. Amen and amen and amen. You may be seated. Amen. Come on, let me hear it, sister. Amen. He never you. He That's right. Yes. Amen. That's right. Yes. Amen and amen. Hallelujah. You know, and that was not a paid commercial. That was just what God has done. You know, sometimes people don't, they don't understand. Why do you people, church people, why do you keep going to God's house like that? Because God's been good to me. He's been good to me. He's been faithful. And, you know, when you have a need in your heart, and so, see, that's what people think. They think that God is a spare tire. They, they think that he's just that uh, shot in your arm when you're sick, or he's that uh, uh, COVID virus cure, but he is my everyday life source. I can't make it one day without him, and, and I don't want him to be a clutch. I don't want him to be a, a spare tire. I want him to be my life source. I want him to be the one that I walk alongside that goes ahead of me to make sure the road is safe. The one that holds my hands no matter what. He said, yay, though I walk through the valley of shadow of death. I know sister said it's been three long years. And that can seem like a forever long time, but eternity. That's not even a drop in the bucket. So I'd rather stay with Jesus. I'd rather hold on to his unchanging hand and know that God is going to see me through. And this battle is going to pass. God, he remains faithful. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Hey, be mindful. We have a midweek service. We want you to come and be a part. Wednesday night, 630. We have prayer Wednesday at noon and Thursday at 6 to 7, from 6 to 7. We have Bible study on Saturdays at 6.30. It's an opportunity to come. We preach, the, I mean, we teach the word. We discuss it, and, and we get people to make sure that we all have a clear understanding. Sometimes we even share testimonies about how God touched us through different verses and, and things like that. I challenge you to come and be a part. Let God minister to your soul. And then, of course, our Sunday morning push. Every church is having Sunday morning service. Well, we are too. 11 o'clock, Sunday mornings. Let's come and fill the house of God with hungry souls. And then we'll come back Sunday night. That's for the faithful. That's when you know where, when folks really love God. Do they come back Sunday night? So I love God. I just love him Sunday morning. I love him every day. Amen. <laughs> I want to be in the house of God when the doors are open. You're encouraged to be a part. Amen. Come on, Reverend Tensio, help us receive our Sunday evening tithe offerings and weekly budget offering. You give is giving unto the Lord, and the Lord will bless you. Sir, I left my envelope, but this is mine. You know what I do. I said that to Reverend Tensio, and you're like, what, what do you mean he knows what you give? Well, me and my family, we pledged to give $50 a week for the weekly budget off. Well, that's a lot. It is. But it didn't start out that way. It started out with $5. And this was 30-some years ago. And I was worried about it because we don't always have $5 in our pocket. Can I get a witness? <laughs> But God is faithful, and as I was faithful, God was faithful. And he just kept on blessing me, and I kept blessing him. And so I said, God, as long as you provide, I will provide. And I've been faithful. I challenge you to take that challenge. Pray, ask God at amount, and be faithful. Put it in every week and watch God bring the increase in your life. Amen. He can do it. Not Pastor Hicks, but God can. 
Come on, sister. She has a special. Baptize me, Lord. Upper room, yes, man. Inside Jerusalem, hallelujah. 120 waited until the fire fell on them. The prophecy of Joel was not just for a few, but I receive. When was the last time you prayed, God, fill me with that Holy Spirit. Yes. Fill me with that majesty from on high. That power to be able to speak to demons and they'll have to flee. In the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. I'm so grateful. Amen. I'm so glad I'm not preaching tonight. You say, why? I'm tuckered out. This old man is sweating up a storm. Come on, Reverend Atencio. Preach what God has laid on your heart. Amen. God bless you. He was sitting there looking comfortable like you was. Preach to you, though. Maybe it's me. <laughs> Amen. It's good to be in the house of the Lord. Amen. My first two verses is in 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 10 and 11. 
and I'd like to read it. It says, to whom he forgive anything, I forgive also. This is Apostle Paul talking to the church here. For if I forgave anything to whom I forgave it, for your sakes forgave it, I in the person of Jesus Christ, lest Satan should get an advantage of us, for we are not ignorant of his devices. And I'm taking a text from the book of John, chapter 20, verse 23. Who Whosoever sins, he meet. these are the words of Jesus Christ. Whosoever sins, he remit, they are, remit, they are remitted unto them. And whosoever sins, he retained, they are retained. And with the help of the Lord, we'd like to preach upon the title of message, Remitting Sins. Pastor, can you pray over the message? Amen. The title of our message is The Remitting of Sin. So what does it mean to remit sins? I would like to just uh, look at that, uh, that word remit and look in the Bible and look at some verses and, and see some passages about remitting sins. Uh, and one method of defining a word is, is to know all its synonyms the, the, that uh, uh, are related to it. So when you remit, you relax, you absolve, you pardon, you discontinue, you acquit, you surrender, you leave off, you moderate, you mitigate, to make less severe or serious or painful. You alleviate, you desist as in to cease to abstain, as in cease and desist. Brothers and sisters, do you notice the legal terms that I gave you? This gives us an idea that there's power in remitting someone's sins. Amen. Here are some more synonyms to soften. Have you ever met a hard, callous individual? And you just begin taking authority in the name of Jesus. And yeah. you begin to pray for that man's soul. And yeah. says, I don't care how bad he uh, uh, treats me. Because it's really not him that's uh, treating me bad. I'm praying that his sins will be remitted. Uh, yeah. And that his sins will be forgiven. So that one day he will acknowledge Jesus Christ as his Lord and Savior, so that he could live for it with him for eternity. Amen. If they have harsh words for us, uh, if they even curse us, uh, I, I, we shouldn't take it personal because we want to remit their sins. Jesus remitted the sins of the whole entire world, brothers and sisters. Uh, he remitted your sins uh, when you were in sin. Uh, he remitted mine, and it's our obligation. Uh, it's our duty as the church uh, to remit the sins of all the world. Amen. You hear some more to relent, to excuse, to overlook. To exempt, to transfer, to deliver. If we don't, if, if you have some harsh words for you, they may curse you. But look at the opposite. The opposite of that word remit, so to remit someone's sins. And I want to ask you to ask you, what are you doing when you are not remitting their sins? Consider the antonyms. Something that's opposite 
of the meaning of the word. Uh, uh, to hold. To keep, to retain, to reserve, to tie up, to persist, to continue, to exact, to control, to dominate, to take revenge, to get the upper hand, to bind, repress, suppress, restrain, to rehibit, to prohibit. And when we pray for our family and our friends, our co-workers for this world, They're not saved. They don't know Jesus Christ. When we pray for our city of Albuquerque, when we pray for our state, for our country, for the world, what are we doing? Part of our prayers, his brothers and sisters, is to remit their sins. Because many often, they don't know what they're doing. They don't know what they're saying or what they're doing. Have we been remitting sins? Or have we been retaining them against that individual until the day of judgment? Have you been releasing others in prayer? Have you been sending them forward to have the opportunity to be saved and just praying for an individual, a name that comes before you and say, Lord, I'm praying for their salvation. Lord, I ask you to forgive their sins or iniquities. I, Lord, I'm remitting them. I'm remitting everything that they had against you, Lord, so that you could change their heart, that you could soften them. Uh, if you have, it means that you have been remitting their sins. Uh, but if you've been retaining in them, it means that you're making them responsible to stand before a living God. It means that you've been repressing them. It means that you have been restricting them. And brothers and sisters, I want you to know if you're a Christian, that means that you have authority and you have a power to remit the sins of others. In other words, Jesus says we could bless him or we could curse him. But I would rather be blessing them than cursing them. Remit, according to the Greek Strong's Dictionary, it says to cry out to forgive someone. Yes. To lay aside their sins and that they would come to know Christ. It comes from a word, word a root word meaning off as in to get it off or to shake it loose. The Apostle Paul taught about remitting of sins. This is not no new re doctrine or teaching. It's scriptural, and it's what Christians should do. No matter how hard they, they, uh, uh, they are against you, we need to re intercede for the lost and dying world. Yeah. There will be times that you may even become weary because you just don't see changes. But what do you do? According to John chapter 20, verse 23, you commit, you continue to remit sins. Amen. You continue to take him before God. God. You continue to pray for him. Yeah. Maybe you've prayed the same prayer every time, but you just continue to remit. Yeah. Even when it seems hopeless, you remit. You remit their sins. You never despair in remitting the sins of others because as long as they are alive, there's hope that they too can be saved. Yeah. Oh, the great apostle Paul expresses this uh, kind of intercession perfectly to the Corinthian church. And it's found in 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 10 and 11. It says, to whom you forgive anything, I forgive also. For if I forgave anything to whom I forgave it, for your sakes forgave I it in the person of Jesus Christ. Lest Satan should get an advantage of us, for we are not ignorant of his devices. You see, the apostle Paul had written the church several times. And the incident was an incestuous, young, incestuous relationship. A, a young man had carried on an affair with his stepmother. When Paul heard it, he scolded the church for allowing this to happen. That this individual should be excommunicated from the church. 
with the desire that he would eventually be forgiven if he repented. Yeah. Now, we don't know how, how long this excommunication lasted, but we do know also that he did repent. Yeah. And Paul says, now that he has truly been humble, now that he has repented of his sins, the whole church has to forgive him Amen. of his sins. The whole church has to restore him back into the fellowship of God. They must have love for him. They can't have no, no any type of angst against him. So Paul is pleading with the whole church, including the father, he must forgive his son. He must confirm his love to his son, regardless of the reproach that had been brought to his family, regardless of the reproach that it brought to the church. They must remit this young man's sins. He says, to whom he forgive anything, I forgive also. For if I forgave anything, to whom I forgave it, for your sakes forgave I in the person of Christ. Lest Satan should get an advantage of us, for we are not ignorant of his, de of his devices. One of Satan's devices, brothers, in former times, that persons who fell into gross sin, or after being saved and having professed Christ, they were never to be restored and received in the communion of the church again, lest their repentance be ever so uh, sincere. You see, this cruel spirit, under the show of strict religion at times, and maybe at discipline, is what the Apostle Paul here would caution against us as one of the wiles of Satan. You see, uh, I was reading, it's primarily, it was a, a story of, uh, 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 of Jehovah Witnesses. We know they're a cult, and their doctrine is wrong. But they had uh, excommunicated, and many who have been excommunicated, they're raised in this lifestyle. And so their the church family, they become very tight. And when they had uh, someone would be excommunicated, and I don't believe it's out of anger and stuff like that, but they're trying to restore someone back to God. But the story is that many, many don't become restored. And those that do become excommunicated, there was a high uh, increase in committing suicide. You may ask yourself, why would I re remit a person's sins? Ain't that God's job? But in Matthew chapter 26, verse 28, Jesus said, For this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for the many of the remissions of sins. You see, the wine was the fruit of the vine and should not be substituted by water or anything else. No covenant was made without blood, and there can be no remissions of sins without it. Christ's own blood atoned for sin, and it alone can redeem if accepted for a personal atonement and proper terms are met. When we pray for our president, whether you agree or disagree with him, when you pray over our nation, over our cities, over our community, we have to remit the sins of him. And one of the synonyms of the word remit is to cry out and declare it. Make a declaration in the name of Jesus. And say, I'm declaring. And I'm declaring by the power and the authority that is given me. Brothers and sisters, those prayers are rightly heard from heaven. And by law, you have power and authority to remit them and to release them in Jesus' mighty name. And I believe that there is a particular sin that God wants to remit. The Holy Spirit will give it to us so 
that we could remit it in Jesus' name and in his blood. Because according to 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 20, we are ambassadors for Christ. We are representatives of Christ on earth right now. We are the church right now. And we are representing our faithful Savior who is in heaven. We are his mouthpieces. We re represent him and we speak his authority upon the earth. And I think of Revelation chapter 1, verse 6, which says that one day we will be kings and priests unto God. That promise is already given to us, brothers and sisters. That means we are made kings by Christ. One day we'll receive a kingdom of grace which cannot be taken away from us. We will fare like kings. We'll be clothed like kings in rich apparel. We will be attended as kings. We will reign with Christ on high and we will sit upon his throne. And because we are his ambassadors now on earth. And it should be our desire of practicing, of remitting the sins of others so that they too could be saved. You see, there is the word remitting. Remitting the word. Let us look at to find more scriptures. In Mark chapter 1, verse 14, John the Baptist did baptize in the wilderness. And to preach the baptism of repentance for the remissions of sins. We know that John the Baptist, he was afforded the greatest trust of being a forerunner of Jesus Christ. Uh, you know, that, that I was reading also that a uh, couple days ago about John the Baptist. And it said that John the Baptist did not many miracles, but one of the greatest part of his ministry is that he activated the ministry of Jesus Christ. Amen. That was his duty, brothers and sisters. So not only did he activate a ministry, he activated miracles in the ministry of Jesus Christ. Oh, and it was the greatest ministry yet that man has never received. And But I want you to know, John the Baptist is not here in our days and times. But I want you to know the Holy Spirit is here in the world. The Holy Spirit lives and, imbi and, and, and abides in you. And now, now the Holy Spirit is doing the same duty that John the Baptist is doing. He's activating ministries in each and every one. You may not stand behind a pulpit, but you have words to share, to remit individuals. The Holy Spirit wants to activate a miraculous ministry ministry in each and every one of us so he had a vital a vital role in activating the ministry of Jesus Christ but what he should be known for was that he preached the baptism of repentance for the remission of sins oh he wanted all Israel to know Jesus Christ he was preparing him Oh, he was preparing in the backside of a desert. He started praying when seemingly nobody was around and lifting up his voice. He said, Lord, forgive my nation. Let their hearts be receptive. Soften their hearts. Let them be ready when the Christ comes. Oh, let them be ready when the Messiah comes. Soften hearts, Lord. Soften the hardest of hearts. I'm remitting their sins. I'm remitting my brothers and my sisters sins. I'm remitting the nation so that they could hear the gospel. I don't know how far in the future but I look toward when the world will come under the reign of Jesus Christ and I'm remitting their sins on the backside of a desert. John the Baptist was praying and he was praying for the remitting of sins of souls of men and women and God heard his word God saw the authority he had and he started scrambling angels started working on his behalf 
And when we begin to remit sins, brothers, this is, angels will start dealing with those people to soften the, and we will be able to see the day that they've been converted in knowing Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. They may never have heard our prayer. They may never know the reason how they got saved. But somebody got on their knees and started remitting the sins for that precious individual. Oh, the life and ministry of John the Baptist shows us clearly that repentance and remissions of sins are closely linked. And the Apostle Paul said it is by the foolishness of preaching that men are saved. It doesn't mean we preach foolishness, but it means that men get saved through the preaching of something that seems foolish. And all of a sudden... They become convicted of their sins, and God starts dealing with them, and they get saved. Look at Luke chapter 1, verse 73. It says, The oath which, we, which he sware to our father Abraham. Are you Abraham's seed? If you have been born of the Spirit, and you are a child of faith, you are Abraham's seed. And the rest of this promise is for you. Luke chapter 1, verse 74 through 79. I want to read it all, that he would grant unto us that we being delivered out of the hand of our enemies might serve him without fear in holiness and righteousness before him all the days of our life. And thou, child, shalt be called the prophet of the highest, for thou shalt go before the face of the Lord to prepare his ways, to give knowledge of salvation unto his people by the remission of their sins. Through the tender mercy of our God, whereby the day spring from on high have visited us to give light to them that sit in darkness and in the shadow of death to guide our feet. In the way of peace. How much clearer can he make it? Who is our peace? Jesus Christ is our peace. If we walk in his steps, uh, he gives us light. And then we're able to impart that light to those who sit in darkness. Oh, brothers, it's, it's as dark as Jesus Christ when he started walking on the earth. There's enough darkness. Huh? There's enough gloom. But brothers and sisters, we can start remitting and praying. And that well, we will see people want one. We can see men and women delivered in Jesus' mighty name. Oh, if we walk in his steps, he will give us light. Now I know that passage is talking about Jesus remitting our sins. But Jesus also said in John 14, 12, he says, He that believeth on me the works that I do, shall he do also. Right. To refuse to acknowledge that this promise is for you and for me is to stop short of the whole counsel of the word of God. Was that not the main purpose of Jesus' life and death? He was to redeem the lost. Yeah. In Mark chapter 2, verse 17, it says, They that are whole need not a physician, but they that are sick. I came not to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Look at, go to Romans chapter 3, verse 23 to 26. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, being justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ, whom God has set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are passed to the forbearance of God. To declare, I say, at this time righteousness that he might be just and the justifier of him which believeth in Jesus. Oh, hallelujah. Hallelujah. Romans chapter 4, verses 1 through 8 says, And what shall we say then that Abraham our father, as pertaining to the flesh, is found? For if Abraham were justified by works, he hath wherefore to glory, but not before God. For what saith the scripture? Abraham believed God, and it was counted in unto him for righteousness. 
Not to him that worketh is a reward not reckoned of grace, but of debt. But to whom that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. Thank you, friend. Even as David also describeth the blessedness of the man unto whom God imputeth righteousness without works, saying, Blessed are they whose iniquities are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Oh, blessed is a man to whom the Lord will not impute sin. Oh, I'm so glad. God, God forgive me. I'm so glad when I was condemned. I was so glad when I was in sin. When I didn't even want to come to church, somebody went out of their way and invited me. When I didn't even accept their first invitation, they still persisted. When I didn't even want to go to church, somebody persisted. And it was against my own convictions, but I'm so glad now. Because they took a concern for me. They began remitting my sins. They started praying for me. They're, they started praying maybe. It's possible that he could be forgiven. Give it. It's very possible he's going to soften his heart. He's going to come to love the Lord. He's going to become part of the church one day. Let's just keep on praying for him. Let's just keep on loving him. Huh? Let's just keep on taking his name before God. Brothers and sisters, they were remitting my sins. And I didn't even know it. That's the love of Almighty God. Putting someone have fallen in love with you with their all their heart that is true love brothers and sisters oh brothers and sisters well, Jesus loved us so much he even loved us to death that's how we got to love people we have to love them look at Romans 3 25 it says whom God has set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are passed through the forbearance of God. You see, we have the power to declare the remissions of sins through his righteousness. What sins? The sins that are present. The sins that are past, I'm sorry. It does not say recent or last week's sins. It does not say all the sins one person says committed. It says sins that are past. That includes all the past sins in your life. It includes all the sins in that father's, in that individual's lives, his parents' lives, his grandparents' lives. It includes all the sins in that individual's ancestral life. Oh, God goes deep. God goes deep. You're just not praying to remit one individual sin. You're remitting the sins of his generation. You ask, preacher, how far back is the past? Oh, you just keep on loving him. You just keep on caring. I want to personally tell you today, Jesus takes every sin you've ever committed, all generations behind you, and he remits it. He wants to remit everyone because it is the blood of Jesus Christ that washes away. It's the only thing that has the power to forgive. Nothing else could for forgive our sins, but it's the blood of Jesus that forgives us. No, that is where uh, that is where you're wrong. He will forgive you. Oh, you, he's willing to forgive your secret sins. Uh, it doesn't matter how dark Jesus wants to forgive you. All you have to do is confess tonight and receive him as your Lord and Savior. Brothers and sisters, you can have your sins remitted today. You can have your sins resolved and forgiven. He, he wants to, uh, you can have him discontinued. You could stand before a judge and have him be fully pardoned and forgiven. And then you don't have to owe anything. You walk away as a free man. You could be acquitted. 
you could have be alleviated. Oh, Jesus, I praise you and magnify you. I want to let you know, 2,000 years ago, our Savior was beaten and whipped in your place, and he went to the cross. And I want you to know that cross is a symbol of reproach. It's a symbol of degradation, humiliation, disgust, a most obscene thing to look on. But before he died upon the cross, he was thinking about remitting your sins tonight, brothers and sisters, as I bring, in, bring this message to the close. He was thinking about remitting your sins personally. He was thinking about every generation that would live that had holding sin in their lives because he loves you. He loves you. Jesus loves you. And before he died upon the cross, he was thinking about you. And he said in Luke chapter 23, verse 24, Father, forgive them for they know not what they are doing. He loved men when they hated him. He loved men when they detested him. He loved them as they wanted to kill him. If Jesus could remit the sins of others, then you and I could take authority and begin to forgive their sins. Begin to forgive the sins of people we don't even know in the nations and just start praying. Oh, brothers, that's part of our ministry, our part of our duty in praying for the world. It's to remit sins. Uh, we want to loose some of their sins. Uh, and then we want to bind the sins and the attacks of Satan. But we want them to be re-delivered. We are praying for souls of men and women to be delivered. As I bring this message to a close and you bow your heads and close your eyes in reverence to God. Have you ever remitted? Are you, have you ever been conscious of remitting the sins of others? People you don't know. People you do know and maybe there's someone you've been praying for just a sibling or cousin or someone you know they're, they're living in sin and you've been praying for them. Brothers and sisters, you don't stop praying. You don't stop praying because we got to pray for their salvation. We got to pray that the love of God will move upon them. They'll receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. I preached to you on the title of a message, Remitting of Sins, as I turn the service over to Pastor. God bless you. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they've done. Thank God that we have the opportunity to share that same mercy to someone else in need, just as we were. Let's all find a place to pray. Get a hold of Jesus. Lift somebody else up this night. Lift somebody else up. Ask God to do a mighty work in their lives. Let's pray.
Touch my hands, Lord, my mouth and my heart. Fill my life, Lord, every part. Let the power of the Holy Ghost fall on me. as long as you like. When you're finished praying, consider yourselves dismissed. Think about it, the responsibility that God has given you to be able to remit someone's sin. You could either bind it or you could loose it. I'd rather give it to God. Father, forgive them. They don't know. They don't even recognize. They don't understand. But Lord, give them an opportunity. Let the word of God penetrate their stony heart that they might come to know you as their Lord and Savior. We'll be back for our midweek service Wednesday night, 6.30. Pray for us. We'll pray for you. We love you. Look forward to seeing you. If you've only met us on Facebook, looking forward to the opportunity to meet you face to face. Come on to the house of God. In Jesus' name, amen and amen.